Welcome to Dan Dijon, where we take the more risky aspects of crypto and digital assets and try to find the next 10 to 100x. So today, we're talking about a project that I personally feel has the most massive potential than I've ever talked about any other project out there. On the flip side of that, for every massive potential, you also have an equal amount of risk. So before we talk about Alvara, I just wanna tell everybody that for full transparency, I do not talk about things in this channel that I do not invest in. So I will be investing in Alvara. There's a reason for that. You will see that in a little bit. But again, this has massive potential, but it has risk. So before we dive into it, let's break it down into how we're gonna do this. We always take a look at the cut, the community utility team and tokenomics to see exactly where we're at with this project and what it can do. So like I said, Alvara essentially is instead of a DEX, a decentralized exchange, it's a DeFi hedge fund. It's a DeFi hedge fund for everyone. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's interesting. What does a hedge fund do? Because we hear about them all the time. Well, here's what a hedge fund actually does and why it's so important that we bring that to decentralized finance. So first of all, hedge fund works like this. You got a couple of investors. Could be 10, 100,000, doesn't matter. They all give it to some hedge fund manager, Egghead, who thinks he's gonna do great and he's gonna beat everybody. He's gonna invest in some kind of portfolio, he's gonna put it together, and he's gonna try to give you these specific, these out fantastic returns. Usually hedge funds don't do too fantastic, as a matter of fact, and they also have a lot of fees. However, people like to use hedge funds for a couple of reasons. And unfortunately, uh, one of those reasons of why they can't use it, I should say, is because of Gary Gensler, because people wanna get into this, however, the way that you can get into a hedge fund is you have to be an accredited investor in the United States. What does that mean? Well, this is taken directly from the SEC website. And it states that you must be generally an accredited investor, which means having a minimum level of income or assets to invest into hedge funds. So that means that you have to make either 200,000 plus a year for two years straight and have the expectations of making the same or greater in the third year or have a joint income of 300,000 of two years as well, or a net worth of $1 million, and that cannot include your primary house, so you have to have other assets and, of course, other income. If you don't have that, sorry, Charlie, if you don't got money, good luck making money. But don't worry, because Gary's protecting you. And that is essentially what hedge funds to get into them actually do. Now, to talk negatively about hedge funds, let's take a look at the positive aspects of what really the real degenerates actually play around with, which would be those hedge funds. First of all, you can get into private equity. You can get into unlisted companies and startups. Again, risk. You can get into private debt and take that on. Of course, you can also get into real estate, real estate investment trust. You can get into loans for real estate, which is actually quite profitable, however, a little bit risky. You can get into commodities, oil, gas, and metals, collectibles, anything across the board, including paintings as well. And you also have structured products like a principal protected upside note, which again is just a nice fancy way of saying that we're gonna give you something that's a little bit risky, but not as much. You can invest in the S&P 500. We're gonna give it to you guaranteed of five years. If it outperforms, we'll give you something, but if not, we can dial that back and give you your initial investment. So again, this is all about hedge funds, real world assets, and again, where the real degenerates play in my personal opinion. Now, that brings us to Alvara Protocol. So what are they doing? Well, they're gonna change the way people invest. How do they do that? It's a crypto fund platform that enables the creation and self-management of tokenized basket funds, poised to empower the upcoming generation of fund managers. And what's crazy about that is to break it down is that essentially you're going to be a fund manager. About the protocol itself, it's a decentralized platform. It utilizes the ERC BTS, which is a new standard on Ethereum, which is a basket token standard. Now you're familiar with an ERC-721, maybe you know it as another name, an NFT. An ERC-7621 is the basket token standard. This creates and manages funds on the blockchain. Alvar offers a comprehensive uh, fund factory, marketplace, a leaderboard showcasing who's doing what and who's doing well. So it becomes 100% transparent. So again, what this means is that if you want to do, it might behoove you to go into this and say, I would like to manage these types of funds. You can pick your basket, you can put it on a leaderboard and people can invest with you. Or of course you can, and of course you can manage your basket of different cryptos that you have, 
or people can just follow and invest with the top crypto accounts. So why I like this so much, it's very simple. It's because everything on the blockchain is open, it is immutable, and you can see it as proof. If Bernie Madoff was doing this on the blockchain, there would not have been a Ponzi scheme for two decades. And this is the same thing that we see with the FTXs of the world, with the Voyager, with the Celsius of the world. Without blockchain and keeping things transparent, these things would not have happened. So if we have something like this where everything's out there in the open, now people can put their money where their mouth is and there are all these great traders that you've heard about forever on YouTube, X, every other different social media platform, you can say, you know what? Let's see exactly how good you do and put yourself up against about, oh, I don't know, Fidelity and BlackRock and we'll see how things are going. So there is a marketplace where BTS creators can list their ERC BTS tokens for auction. You can sell the rights to your fund. So let's say you're doing pretty good, right? You pick the right things. You got a whole nother basket. You got a whole different bunch of things. And of course, they are going cross chain. They're not just sticking with Ethereum as well. So management rights and revenue streams include a percentage of the trading fees. You can sell the rights to your fund if you so choose to. And again, clear data so we can see all the shenanigans that are going on behind the background if there is or is not. So how do you do that? How do you set it up? Well, today we're going to have one of the founders, Dominic, come in and he's going to show us exactly how to set this up and how easy it actually is. But just as a, as a lighter refresher, all you got to do is do three things. Essentially, you name it, upload your logo, add the tokens you want to include your basket, allocate the percentage weighting, and you can also auto rebalance. So like right here's a little example. And this one, they use uh, Alvaro, Mana from Decentraland, Sand, and Axie Infinity. And you notice one thing about this is that the token, Alvaro, it's at 5% on both of these examples. And the reason is, is because when you're going to use BTS, when you're going to use this on their platform, it is included in the program that you have to use at least 5%. What does that mean? That means that everybody who spins one of these up has to have at least 5% of Alvara protocol within their BTS to be these essentially hedge fund managers. So what does that mean for the Alvaro token holders? I think you know where we're going with this. So on top of that, they also have minting fees, which is 1%. Total cost of initial creation of a new BTS is 1%. And this is what I like, half percent burning Alva and another half percent going to the foundation. If you know anything about burning, when you burn a specific amount of tokens, that what it leads to is a little more scarcity. And what's great about this is that the max supply is 200 million. So imagine a half a percent is being burned for every time of initial creation of a new BTS. That's quite a bit. So as time goes on, I think this could do pretty well. Again, I think this is one of those things with massive upside, but it is risky. And also on top of that, you can also add liquidity if you wanna be a liquidity provider to any BTS. Tokens can be uh, committed to the uh, liquidity pool. It can be done individually or paired with other assets. Like I, we talked about, if this is not a, a single chain, they're going multi-chain. ETH, USDT, AVAX, or Binance Coin, or BNB. As liquidity providers, users will share 30% of all transaction fees. Side note, I will probably be a liquidity provider for them. And we'll go from there. Also on top of that, you can do staking. Staking Alva tokens on our platform. You will unlock access to the token rewards vault. And uh, when you stake it, you get VAlva. And this is for the governance token, vote escrowed Alva. And what's interesting about the DAO, essentially what's happening here, is that the quorum for the Alvara DAO is 20%, which means that at least 20% of the VAlva holders must participate in a vote for it to be valid. The, the pass rate, which is the percentage of votes required for a proposal to be successful, is 51%. So if there's anything going on here where they say, you know what, we're going to change some of the mechanisms, or you know what, we're going to change the way that things are being done for as far as balancing. This will be done by the DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. You're going to be able to vote for that because you have staked your ALVA and received your VALVA. So on that piece, there's also another also interesting aspect. If you're so inclined, they're having an airdrop right now. Links in the description. It's very simple. If you think to yourself, I don't really want to invest in this, but maybe I'll dip my toes into it with a little airdrop. Great. There's a, again, link. You can go to this and just fill out all the quests, which essentially join them on their Discord, their X, uh, going through the uh, process itself. And of course, uh, you can get an airdrop as when they go live, which is happening for the uh, TGE or for the actual launch on 
Tencent, February 28th, not too far away. Now we talked about the utility essentially. We haven't got to the other parts, but let's talk about tokenomics, which is kind of like the make or break type of thing. So again, on the very up, upper right-hand side here, the total supply, 200 million ALVA. That's it. There is no more to be created. Fully the market cap is 60 million. Target raise is 6.1. What I want you to notice about this, the big thing about tokenomics is how much is being given or allocated to seed rounds, private rounds, and strategic partners. You never want this as a very high amount. You also never want this to be very high as far as an unlock at TGE. A TGE is the token generation event. That's when they actually mint the tokens and give them out so they can sell. You want these VCs, angel funds, and everybody else to have a low percentage as possible and also a lowest percentage possible also as TGE. So with this one, it's minimal. You're looking at four, four, and 1.5. 9.5%, not too bad. And we take a look on the far right-hand side, the unlock of TGE is 0%. A cliff, meaning what they can't touch, that's six months, three and three. And the vesting or unlock schedule is, this is a long time, 24 months, that's two years. It gets unlocked every single month. And that's for, again, for two years for this project to find its footing. I think this is a, a pretty good play on their part. And 18 and 18 for private strategic. KOL round, the, uh, that looks like half a percentage. And it looks like there's going to be 50% unlocked. But the great thing about that is it's only 0.5%. And then, of course, stage five on 10 set, that's going to be 4%, which is a you know, hefty amount, I should say. That's okay. And then uh, 2% for the actual airdrop uh, when they go live. So we're looking at... And then, of course, the unlock at TGE, 25% for 10 set, and the airdrop is 0% at TGE, but it's only a one month cliff and six months. So, again, looking at all this stuff, I wasn't too concerned with it. It looks pretty solid, especially for the length of time for the vesting. That is honestly quite a long time. But there is one down here, if you'll notice, the percentage of tokens of that 200 million. And we're looking at, you know, four to 15% for team. All right, got to keep the lights on. Grants and builders, five. Foundation gets 10. Maybe they want to you know, do some marketing and stuff like that. Affiliates and marketing, I guess that'd be the other 5%. Dex, liquidity, five. And then BTS incentives was 44%. That's a lot. That's 88 million. What does that mean? Well, for all the things that we talked about for staking, you got to give rewards, right? Well, that's where those comes from. That's the incentives. But I was worried about this because I think to myself, okay, well, what's the vesting unlock schedule? And you look over here, 372 months. What does that mean <laughs> as far as the time frame? Well, does that mean there's going to be massive inflation? No. If we take a look at that per day, some there, somewhere around uh, 40,000 of ALBA tokens uh, for, this, of course, those are daily rewards. Yearly are 14 million, 669. But as we go across the board, it gets less and less. And they actually space this out to 31 years. Now, I don't know if you're going to be here. I hope I am. I'm kind of up there in years. So if you make it all the way to 31 years, let me know how it goes. So I don't think this is as uh, inflation as uh, uh, or other projects are. I think this is actually a pretty good move and it's stretched out as for as, pretty much as long as you possibly can. And then now that we talked about the utility, we talked about the tokenomics, let's talk about, I think one of the red flags, honestly, is the community. And the community from what I've seen so far is you got 27,000 on X, and you got a whopping 2,000 on Telegram, and I couldn't even find their Discord. So if we're under the assumption that a lot of these projects, really what it comes down to is speculation and hype, this is not good. So if hopefully they bring on some other people that can actually do some marketing and get it out there, it looks like a fantastic project. And if you see that, then <laughs> that could be one of your one of your signals to say, okay, this could actually do far. But so far, I mean, to, to move it, it's not looking too hot. So let me to our last point, the team. Pretty strong team. Uh, Callum Mitchell Clark, 10 years of business owner, managing experience, project management, marketing, consumer psychology, legal experience. Dominic Ryder, who we're going to talk to in a second, he's going to do the uh, demo. He's the senior derivatives trader and head of desk partner at FTSC 100 London-based wealth management. St. James Place, Max Green, managed global strategic company for Fortune 500 companies, and Joey Van Eaton, accounting financial and tax advisor, experience at Deloitte and EY. 
So uh, pretty good background, pretty good mix of people. But really, then again, it all comes down to execution. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to jump in. I'm going to have Dominic show you how this actually works to mint it. And uh, we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Looking forward to uh, chatting everything through and uh, explaining the many intricacies of the platform. Yeah, I mean, it, there is some intricacies. Uh, like I said, this is probably the one with the most massive potential, but there's a bit of risk to it, like all investments are. So I wanted to really get a hang of it, like how easy or difficult it is to actually uh, mint these tokens and actually go through a demo. So there's only one person that can do that, and that'd be you. So let's, uh, let's run through it, huh? Absolutely. So yeah, we have our factory contract, which essentially allows for anyone, uh, no matter if you have any coding experience at all, uh, to mint your own BTS to your wallet and become essentially your own manager of a basket of tokens. So uh, let's add in an image. I think I've got uh, central bank liquidity, which is just a uh, our favorite fueling digital asset news and we go for dan nice yep importantly we solve the scalability problem that some of our competitors have had uh in the fact that you know uh, enzyme finance is one they're limited to 12 tokens astrodow is another they have non-transferable lp tokens which mm. means that you can't actually scale or build on top of that because you are limited by those and a lot of these protocols, they try and control decentralization rather than manage it. And that means that you end up doing the job of the regulator. If you decide who can or can't manage, you know, a basket of tokens, you're essentially saying who can or can't manage a fund and you are never going to have a decentralized protocol because somebody needs to be whitelisting who can actually mint these. And so we take the Uniswap, Uniswap Labs approach where if if on uni or, or pancake swap you go to buy a honey pot they will tell you uh when we read this transaction it reverted do you want to continue if if a person still decides to do that you know that is their choice and their decision our job and why we're decentralized is to make sure that everyone is fully aware where there could be any problems but if people still choose to ignore them then that's how we maintain decentralization and why we have the scalability so a minimum of uh five percent is in the alva token so mm -hmm. there's no fee at first to mint a bts because uh, we want to obviously populate the platform right uh, but it's more of a stipulation so like i mentioned anyone who's developing their own they don't need to have that five percent this is purely just for the factory contract so Right. Add that in. So, so, Check. so Dominic, just just to be sure. So, like, for if someone wants to create their own basket and go, I just want to do this and have it over here, and then I can rebalance as I see fit. They don't have to put in five percent of Alva. This is for the BTS managers who want to come in and say, you know what, this is my fund essentially. This is what I'm managing, and you can do whatever you want with that. Is that correct, or is it off? Uh, so, the BTS as a standard is is recognized by our protocol whether it has if it fits the token standard we yeah. will recognize it so anything that's minted through the alvara protocol our site and this factory contract that will have a minimum of five percent okay. but if, if you are hand coding it or, ah, gotcha. uh, any developer can create a bts for you uh, because the code is published and they don't need to include the five percent when somebody is building it for you or you're coding it yourself, the 5% minimum in Alva is only for people using this sort of easy one-click option. We pay for convenience, gotcha. Exactly, so uh, we got, let me check my maths is on and then let's do 25 here, allocate. As I mentioned, this is on Goali Ethereum at present. Um, here we gotcha. go, click Mint. All right, Dan is live. Fantastic. And, and we can uh, see this on the scanner. Yep, just waiting for it to index, but it should, uh, with a little bit of a refresh, uh, let's take a look and see. Yeah, it says it's confirmed on MetaMask, so okay. it should be a process of just, there we go. So you can see this is the factory contract, and we are calling the create BTS function from my wallet here. 
everything swaps within the one transaction into the underlying tokens, the 5% Alvaro, uh, the 20% Invent, the 30% in Sand, et cetera. And you can see that yeah. BTS here has been created uh, currently because obviously the token standard isn't and doesn't have an official number. It's reverted to the 721 because it's an NFT containing other tokens. And so you create BTS and it's minted from the ether to the wallet. And uh, as you can see, and you saw about the uh, Dan is live here, what we allow for is the aggregation of all of these, both hand minted and factory minted onto the Alvara leaderboard where we have all of the gamification, all of the you know monetization opportunities as you have with like index tools, you know, CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap, trending, you know, top managers. And our job as a foundation is really to make sure that we can sort of uh, incentivize people who are building uh, on top of this infrastructure because the scalability um, of what we have and the opportunity for individuals uh, is incredible in terms of people can come to the platform and if they do happen to be, um, you know, I guess, lucky enough uh, that they get some followers and people contribute Ethereum to their BTS, if yeah. they begin to actually um, earn a revenue yeah, and they can afford to start building out on top of their protocol, then you have the ability for hundreds of sub DAOs, thousands or tens of thousands of individual protocols built on top of the basket token standard. We're, uh, uh, we're in. Um, so you can see here that when you nice. contribute, you can add in 0 0.1 and in return, uh, once this goes through, um, successfully contributed and let's see where very fast let's see if Go goerly says the same see here the key part of all of this and what makes it you know truly uh infinite in its scalability is the fact that every single bts manager knows exactly who their holders right. are because every single person that contributes mm -hmm. receives the erc20 uh lp tokens and so these are unique to every bts so you can see this is the Dan LP. And this means that you as a manager, if you build up enough AUM, or even if you want to do this before you start to add a reason for people to contribute, you can add liquidity, you can build staking, you can build uh, lending, you can build derivatives, you can build arbitrage strategies, anything that can be innovated and built on top of a normal ERC20 token can be built on top of your BTS and the BTS's ERC20 LP token everybody can be a successful fund manager if they have the talent it's a complete meritocracy where the very best talent will rise to the top of the leaderboard and what we've done to make this truly institutional in the governance mechanism is that we've taken the gauge weight voting of curve finance and applied it to the bts's lp tokens so yeah interesting prospects that's for sure so then to talk about that you lead me to another question which would be and we kind of touch on this in one of our first slides when we talk about hedge fund managers and derivatives and the different uh, assets that are out there so talk to us about like what are the next steps because this what we're taking a look at here is it's it's from visual capitalists we're taking a look at all the wealth in the world every one of these little blocks here these little squares is 100 billion dollars so we have you know, precious metals are gold, around $12 trillion. Uh, central bank balance sheets is 28 trillion. The S&P 500 is 36. Uh, global money supply is over 100 trillion. Stock markets themselves, 120 trillion. Global debt, 300 trillion. And of course, uh, real estate, one of the big ones, and we're looking at over 500 trillion and global wealth for 63. And I think the big one, big one, big one, is derivatives, which is almost one quadrillion. I didn't know that was actually a, a, a word, but apparently it is. So uh what are the next steps for you guys because there's a lot of opportunity out there but is this something that you guys are looking at yeah i mean um what we've touched on in terms of uh the demo and ran through you know that is very much just the liquid token side of the bts and of alvaro as the protocol and uh you know infrastructure built around it mm -hmm. in reality any any erc20 anything that can be tokenized 
and if there is liquidity can be wrapped into a BTS, which means that you can look at it like a, a multi-spec. You can raise money as a private investor, as long as you have tokenized private investment to put within that BTS, essentially you can bring a multi-spec BTS to market. If people are interested, you raise Ethereum within that, and then you can allocate it to those tokenized um, private companies. Got At the it. same time, you can add a liquid crypto basket if there is um you know i was speaking to someone the other day who ran uh like agriculture commodities on chain so you can have bitcoin with wheat with property mm. with a private investment it, as long as it's an erc20 and it has a representative on chain and that there is liquidity then you can Put it all together. There's no limit yeah. from us. There's no limit from anyone. It is just a token standard that by definition, the code allows for it to contain as many ERC-20s as you like. It does not matter what type of sector, asset, or what it represents. If it is an ERC-20, then you can wrap it within the BTS. And because it's in a BTS, you can bring contributors in and you can manage that as a portfolio. Well, that's the power of the blockchain. So then, so thanks for that, Dominic. And then the, the last one is because, is the last question I have, which is I think one of the biggest ones is, now you guys have, you've been playing this for quite some time. I'm gonna say this is over two year development, I'm sure. And all the, all the different process you had to go through, the white paper we took a look at, all the different times that you put into it and the legal aspect. So when we talk about the legal aspects, I know you guys have probably accumulated many a legal fee for, for going through like, what is the plan here? So talk to us because you are the platform. You don't, you, of course you guys aren't the hedge fund, right? But the people that are going to do all these things and go through it, how does that work as far as a legal process? And can you speak to that uh, moving forward? Yeah, so we're taking uh, the reason why we have built the platform the way that it is and also what, how we've managed to solve the scalability issue is that our competitors are too involved in their platform and in the decisions. And they're doing it for the right reasons. We're not doubting that. You know, the reason they're allowing for only certain whitelisted managers is because they want to protect the contributors, which is, yeah. you know, uh, honorable. And it's something that we are doing as well. But the difference is, is that we take the protection to the level that we tell you if you're about to contribute to something where the manager has discretionary permissions, they provided no KYC, no information, haven't connected to Twitter, haven't connected to YouTube. If we tell you that this person can, you know, buy a honeypot um, with your Ethereum and it causes that you can't withdraw, our job is to let you know that that's a possibility. If you decide to ignore us telling you that and still contribute anyway, then we we can't do more than we've already done. Because if we if we start to control who can manage, then yeah. we are doing the job of the regulator. And obviously right. the regulator won't be happy with that. And therefore, it's like Uniswap. Uniswap, tons of people list what the Securities Exchange Commission calls securities on Uniswap but they go after the person who is launching the security. Um, they don't go after Uniswap because Uniswap is a decentralized smart contract. And so in order to maintain the same level of decentralization, we need to accept that decentralized technology, there will always be bad actors who are trying to uh, use it uh, for nefarious deeds. Our job is to make sure that we let people know when that could be a possibility which is why we have the trust score, which is why we'll flag up certain behaviors and we'll have the ability to, you know, have community voting, but we can't stop it. If, if, if people want to do stupid things like ignore a massive risk warning saying this person could, you know, effectively take your money, right. you know, we can't, we can't look after every angle. At some point, somebody has to take responsibility for their actions. Um, and so that is how we maintain decentralization. And that's why we are scalable, because by controlling who can or can't, you know, 99.9% .9 of the fund management industry is pure discretionary. They might have like a vote once every quarter. They might have like a sure. clause where they can vote the manager out. But in reality, 
you know, they call the shots and you're giving them that trust. And so if we only allow for governance based uh, BTSs where people vote on every holding, immediately you're, you're alienating 99.99% of your market. Well, excellent. Well, Don, that was uh, comprehensive. So I will say that uh, thank you for coming on and doing the demo and explaining a little bit more of what's going on. So everybody, uh, all we'll do is uh, all the links that we just talked about, of course, are in the description. Dominic, thanks so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey, Dominic, thanks. That uh, made a lot of sense, and uh, we appreciate it. Now let's uh, finish this up. So a couple of things. First of all, for this one, for the TGLP over at Tencent, here's what you got. Total supply is 200 million tokens. This is essentially the launch pad, Tencent, which we've talked about before. If you're not familiar with this, there is a link in the description. And it talks about the launch pad that is Tencent, how to actually get access to Tencent launch pad. And uh, of course, why I'm using uh, Tencent itself. But for this uh, project itself, you've got 25% of tokens unlocked the TG, which we talked about in the tokenomics. Remaining 75% unlock monthly for three months. So in three months after this, you get all your tokens. That's pretty darn good. And then what's even best about this, I think, is you're like, there's a seven day claim, no questions asked back policy on this one. That's why I partnered up with, with Tencent and said, hey, what else you guys got? Because I like this seven day thing. A lot of these different launch pads, they launch and in a day everything peaks and then it crumbles and, and nothing goes anywhere. So with seven days, you can say, you know what? I don't like where this thing went. Give me my money back. Here you go. And that's pretty much it. So uh, you can check that out. Again, how do you get access? Links in the description. You can go from there. Now, let's go to the pros and cons. I think we talked about this, but let's make this transparent. The pros. Like Dominic was talking, we were talking about as far as real world assets and global assets. It's almost unlimited potential what you could do with this. It really is. And um, it makes it it makes it interesting, but but complex. And I, I hope it works. But but again, there's a lot of risk. And then uh, another pro is you can start a revenue generating business right now. Now, again, as we're talking about this in the United States, you know, there's multiple opportunities. But think about this globally, what this could do for a lot of different people out there. I mean, if you can start a business like this, I mean, just internet connection and device looks pretty good. Uh, number three, stays true to the ethos of decentralization, transparency. Again, the uh, Bernie Madoff reference. I think if there was more transparency, we wouldn't have the collapse of the FTX, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, and everything else in between because we had the ability to actually see behind the scenes. Tokenomics looks good with deflation, with the burning. Strong team. And, of course, you <laughs> hear Dominic talk. The guy, he does love his project. I give it to him. And the, the last one, USA is welcome which was quite surprising to me. And uh, this would actually lead me to my last point, which is the cons. I didn't, I was kind of not, not suspecting, um, expecting this. The cons is this, legal. And we talked about this and you heard what he said, but then after it, and I, I didn't get it to when me and Don were talking about the legal aspect because you know he comes from that traditional finance space. And he goes, look, he goes, the whole thing with legal, with every different three letter organization out there is that they give you just as much as much information that to be legally successful, but not enough to where they can't reel you in. If they want a piece of you, they're gonna get it. He goes, look what happened with Ripple. They did everything right. They went and talked to everybody. They did in the right documentation, but it still didn't matter. They had to go to court and they had to beat them to say, look, you guys are full of it. And this is the reason why. So when we talk about legal, I was like, why did you guys come to the United States? And they go, look, they go, if these things want to have happened, uh, we suppose so. But it's in our belief that the, the decentralized aspect of it, of course, we're just the platform. People are doing these things and, and uh, doing these derivatives. They go, in all honesty, if they want to do anything, they can haul us all in. So we'll see how it goes. That's why I say, it is risky, but uh, for token holders, that's eh, up to you. And then lastly, the adoption of the ERC-7621. Now, that one, it hasn't been ratified or approved by the Ethereum Foundation. So if we hear about this, and if it does come out that they say, yeah, we can, we're, we're going to implement that, this thing will take off. So if it happens, great. I don't expect this to happen anytime soon, but if it does, I'll let you guys know. 
But if it is, again, massive potential. Number three, this actually has real utility, which scares me because uh, in this uh, in our crypto market, I have to tell you that I think it's a mostly speculation and hype that really drives the markets and not real world utility. A lot of different products out there actually do great stuff and are stagnant. So I'm hoping that in the next bull run, they really take off. But again, this one has real utility, so it actually kind of scares me. And then lastly, lastly, if projects are all about hype, then Houston, we've had a problem. And what this means is this. If we take a look at the information that we have as far as the community, there's not really much going on. I'm one of the first ones to really talk about this. And it's because of my relationship with Tencent. And the reason why is because they reach out to me and go, this is going to be a great project. We'd like you to talk about it. Sure, take a look at it. But right now, as it stands, nobody's talking about this. So if you don't hear too many things about too many people hyping it up, it might not be a good one. It might take a long time to really get into it. But if you want to get in early, it's up to you. I can't give you financial advice. I can only tell you what I'm doing. And I think this one's going to do pretty good. But again, risk. That's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. But that's it for today. I appreciate you checking this out. And I'll see you on the next one.